All right, today is Monday, May 2nd. I'm going to go over Chapter 9. Probably will only take about an hour. Uh, after the break, I'm not going to do anything more today, but what I am going to do for you is I've gone through and I've written uh, an extremely simple calculator um, in Java without using any GUI stuff. I'm going to give you the hard copy of it. If you want to key that in, you can't. You don't have to. You're not getting any points for doing it. But if you want it, so I will give everyone a hard copy of that. So what I'm going to do on um, Wednesday is I'm going to go over an example at the end of this chapter. Next week will be a lab. And then the last week that we're here, which is two weeks from now, I believe. No, three weeks. Three, we have three more weeks. Three weeks. Yeah, but two weeks from now will be the last week. So two weeks from now on that Monday, I'll go over this program that I'm going to give out today. And I'll probably have, you know, in case you lose it or whatever, but I, I'd rather have you have copies because I've got like 15 copies upstairs. And there's a better chance that I'll misplace them than probably than you will. And then on that last Wednesday, we'll go and we'll create that same thing, but we'll create it in Java using GUI Java. All right. So I'm on page 559, Chapter 9, Text Processing, and more about wrapper classes. This is kind of one of those hodgepodge chapters in that the author puts together some stuff that probably does belong together and some, some stuff that may or may not belong together but puts it all together in the same chapter. So the first thing we're going to do is talk about wrapper classes. Now, by and large, with wrapper classes, you've already used them, whether you realize it or not, because you've already done stuff like where you read something in and then later you, you say something along the lines of uh, input, no, uh, let's say age equals integer, integer dot parse int of some kind of an input string. That's a wrapper class. So you've already started using some of those. Now think about this. I'm, I'm asking you a question. You all should, everybody here should be able to answer this. If we have, if we have uh, a short, an int, a long, a float, got one here, a byte, a float, a double, a char, and a boolean. All right. What you're going to see when we go through these is most of these are going to have different kinds of wrapper classes, but not all of them. All right. And you're going to know, you're going to see them in just, in just a couple minutes. All right. Then we talk about stuff you can do with a character class. And guess what? The examples they've shown, I'd already shown this to you. If you remember when, when we said, uh, do you want to continue, yes or no, and then they use the char at with zero to just grab that first character, they show an example like that. But we've already looked at that. Um, they show you a, a bunch more string methods. Okay, I'm not going to spend much time on those. Again, I've said this to you in the past, that if you go out to java.sun.com if you go out there and you go in and you know they've changed the way it looks again and you go out to java apis you grab any one you can grab the newest one if you want that's fine and you come down into here and i guess it'll be down here and you find string which will be here someplace again if you start looking through here method summary you'll notice that there's quite a few different methods that you can use with strings. All right, so this chapter goes over some of those. Then they talk about the string builder class. You may or may not have heard this word before, but one thing about strings, not only in Java, but in virtually every pro programming language. If I come through there and I do this, so I come through here and I type in string name equals Jeff Scott, okay? Literally, someplace in memory, all right, it's going to be called name, but the, the whatever, you know, I put Jeff Scott in there, that's what's going to be held in there. Does that make sense? But later on in my program, 
if they say, oh, no, you got to use your formal name. So they want something like that. If I do that later on in the program, it doesn't go back to that memory location and change it from Jeff Scott to Jeffrey P. Scott. Instead, what it does is it goes in and it grabs a new memory location and it puts Jeffrey P. Scott there. Then it takes the old memory location and basically it flags it as being available so when the garbage collector comes again, it can free up that memory. Does that make sense? Because it's kind of an important concept. All right? And what this is, if you've never heard the term before, strings are immutable. And that's what I just showed you. On the other hand, what Java allows you to use is what's called a string builder. That is mutable. So, for instance, I could take a string and I could build it up as, as, as a name, a string builder, <clears throat> And I could have, I could have, first I could ask a person for their first name, then I could ask them for their middle initial or their middle name, then I could ask them for their last name. Now I can't do that with just a single string, but I can do that with a string builder. All right? So a string builder, unlike a string, is mutable. It can be changed. Tokenizing strings. For tokenizing, if I look at this right here, Okay, and this should make sense to all of you. That's a paragraph, right? A paragraph consists of two sentences. How do I know when the sentence ends? When I get a period. Each sentence contains a bunch of words. Each word contains a bunch of letters. What do I have between words? Blank space, right? That's the token. Okay, so when we talk about tokenizing strings, you can set virtually just about anything you want as a token. For instance, if you're working with dates, uh, for today's date, I might put in 05-02-2016. Then the dashes are the tokens. Sometimes we use forward slashes. The international thing to use for a date are periods. So it just depends on what you're using. All right. Again, I already mentioned this, the wrapper class for numeric data types. They go through a thing here with a test score reader and some common errors. It's really not a real long chapter. All right. My hope is by now, and I'm not asking you to, but if I said to you what we looked at in here before, if I said to you what are the eight different primitive data types in Java, you'd know that. You could write it down. I'm not asking you to, but you just know it. All right. Those, remember, they're simple data types. They're also known as elementary data types because they can only hold one value at a time. When we got into chapter, I think it was seven, we started to look at data structures. And in particular, we looked at arrays and a little bit at array lists. All right. As, it's, as it says, Java provides wrapper classes for primitive data types. So what the heck does that even mean? You'll see it a little bit later on in the chapter, but it allows you to use a simple data type as though it was a class. And you'll see it a little bit later. It's typically not the way they're used, but they can be. All right, character conversion. Is letter, is digit, is letter or digit, is lowercase, is uppercase, is a space character, is white space. Does all, do those make sense to people when you look at them? All right. <clears throat> Think about this. It would be possible... We haven't done, we've done virtually no error checking this semester. We've done validation checking, but we've done virtually no error checking. That's why if, if somebody asks your age and you put, leave it blank, or you put down 33 and you write it out instead of the numbers, you T-H-I-R-T-Y, et cetera, you get errors. All right? But what you could do is as you're putting something in, you could allow a person to input it, then you could use the is digit and put it into a loop. And as long as they were putting in digits, you could take it. Now, that's in, in many ways, that's what JavaScript does. You may or may not remember with JavaScript, if I type in, if it asks me my age, and I type in there 35, and I put an X after it, JavaScript still takes it. 
All right, it takes anything, as long as you start it with a number, it takes that number. Java blows up as soon as it finds something that's non-numeric. All right, so you can start to do some error checking with is digit, and again, hopefully the rest of them just make sense. Notice with the is white space, that can be a, a space, a tab, or a new line. So they give you a program that goes through this, and again, very similar to stuff we've looked at before. All right. But they're saying, show me the input. You'll notice three, it says it's a, or A rather, it says it's a letter and it's lowercase. And they give you other examples. All right. Again, I have no doubt that every one of you could do that. Okay. Now, when they've got a customer number here, this is a little bit trickier because notice it says that you have to put a customer number has to be seven characters long. The first three characters have to be letters, and the last four characters have to be numbers. Make sense? Now, when you think about it, the simplest check you can make on that is whether or not your input was seven characters. Because if it's less than seven or more than seven, it's invalid regardless of what's in there. But the way the author does this is he breaks it down, and he says... So one check is seven characters or not. This is another check. Is it letter? Is it letter? Is it you know letter? So you have to run that on those. And then on this one, is is digit? Oops. Is digit? Is digit? Is digit? Is digit? Four times. All right. So the way he looks at this and the way he attacks it is he says, okay, if it's seven characters long, I'm going to put in some kind of a boolean variable call like keep going. And I want to first count, make a count of the, of the characters in there. If it's seven, keep going is true. If it's not seven, it's false because I'm done. All right? Then he breaks it up and he's got another Boolean that he calls like good so far. And if those three are both letters, he can keep going. If one of them was a blank or a non-letter, you know, either a number or a special character, he's done. But if it's seven and if those first three are letters, then he can go in and check the last four. And if those are numbers, it passed. If any one of those four things in there is non-numeric, it fails. Does that make sense? That's exactly what he does in here. Calls it good so far. Again, if the length is not equal to seven, he sets good so far equal to false. Then he breaks it up. This check in here, then, is for the first three characters. He only goes into it if good so far is true. Then he checks, and he runs on the next three characters. He runs the char at, and he checks to see whether or not it's a letter. Didn't say in here it had to be a capital or a lowercase letter. Okay? And if he finds something that's non-letter, non he sets good so far to false. So if you get down into here, let's do it this way. If you, go, if, if, if you get to here, it's seven characters. If you get to here, it's seven characters, and the first three were letters. If you get to here, all right, you're either going to have set it to false because one of those things failed, or it's still set to true as it was originally. Again, there's different ways this could be done. This is the way the author decided to do it. And he shows an example. Letter, 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 for number, 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 it's valid. Letter, letter, number, 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 letter, letter, it's invalid. It's always nice when you're going to do this to show somebody an example of what they should be looking for. You know, I've said this before, and it's not meant to be funny. I don't think this is funny. You know, you can't account for human ignorance. You really can't. Because if someone is going to keep typing in something wrong, you've got two choices. Either let them keep doing it, or give them a certain number of tries. You know, when you think about it, that, isn't that what we do here? You log in in the morning. All right? If I, if I do my password wrong three times... It kicks me out for 10 minutes or whatever the heck it is. 
All right, so he explains all that maybe better than I just did. I don't know. The character conversion, pretty simple. Two lower and two upper. And they show an example. That's not typically how it's going to be used. I mean, you can use it like that. All right. But in the example here in this area thing, very similar to what we talked about in here. Again, we've looked at this before. And remember, if you look at line 39, the second one that, that's there in blue, or the third one, I guess, and it says, while character dot two uppercase choice equal y, remember, we're doing that because we only have to make one check then. We don't have to check for a little y or a big y. And it's even worse if it's, we told them to put in yes. Because think of it. It could be all lowercase, all uppercase, or a, mix you know, a, a mixture. All right. One thing that, that some people really enjoy and other people really hate are working with substrings. And a substring is just a string within a string. All right. So let's let's suppose that you know the you know the beginning of the Gettysburg Address four score and seven years ago. Let's suppose I wanted to know how many times, and maybe it only is once, but I want to know how many times Lincoln said the word a go in there. Then a go would be the substring, and the string through which I'd be looking for it would be the Gettysburg Address. And there's a lot of work that a lot of programmers do with substrings. A lot of work. All right. Sometimes that you you you're going to go through and you're going to create some kind of a report for management, and they want something special, and you have to dig into a database, and you have to look through text fields to see if something exists in there or doesn't exist in there. So there's a lot of different thing, different ones that you can use here, and they start showing them on. 569 starts with, ends with. This region matches. All right. Again, a region is just an area. All right. And there's different ways that you can set this stuff up. So notice what they have in here. Wow, this program uses starts with to start, search for a partial string. Okay. And guess what? You've already seen stuff like this. In a way, not exactly, but in a way, this is kind of like Google search. All right, that if I type in the letter A, it's going to give me something. But if I type in a J after that, it's going to change, and it's going to give me a lot different things that it didn't show me originally. If I put in another A, it's probably going to go right to like Ajax. All right, so this is a way you could do something like that. And if you look at the example, all right, so it says, Enter the first few characters of the last name. Well, they put all of them in there, but they could have just put in D-A, and that would have found that Davis and that Davis. And there's different ways you can do it. Again, they talk about the region matches. I, you know, There are so many different ways, typically, of working with strings. Okay, And the best thing I can tell you is... <clears throat> to try a few of them and see the one that you're the most comfortable with, okay? Because understanding this stuff is pretty paramount to when you start getting into it and talk about, like, regular expression handling, All right, which we don't do much in this class, but we do a lot more, for example, in fall in the PHP class. In fact, when PHP, it, it looks kind of goofy, but just so you see this, because, you'll again, you'll see it more... Um, next semester, but if I go out to php.net and I start to look through some of their string handling stuff, all right, and I'll, I, I probably won't grab one I want, but string functions does not exist. Oh, it's in here somewhere. With a lot of these that are in there, and like I said, I'll have to search too long. I probably won't be able to find it. But what happens is, in here, the way they refer to it is one of the parameters will be called needle, 
and one of the parameters will be called haystack. Because using and, and working with substrings is like looking for a needle in a haystack. That's where they got it from. So you'll see a lot of that. And it's not the only language, but that's the one I know for sure that has it. All right. So there's a bunch of different ways. It's not my goal to go through these. All right, because again, there's different ways that you can do them. All right, typically, if you're looking for something and it's not there, you return negative one. All right, that's if you're working with position. So if I know that I'm checking 800 characters for something and it's not there, I'll return negative one. I don't return zero because remember, zero is our first location. As far as extracting substring, even more. And they have kind of a neat little program here they call a string analyzer. Notice what you write in here, 99 red balloons. So it shows you that there's 11 letters, two digits, and two white space characters. So you can run a program on that, all right? And you might say, well, big deal, whoever used that. Well, not this, but think about it. Um, you know, I, I've been reading this book on how to write a Muroc book in case I do end up writing for them. And what they say is if you've ever used Word to, uh, to go and show when, when you're working on a, a paper or something, it can show you basically the, the type of audience you wrote it for. And for instance, they'll typically say that it should be at least 10th grade type of thing. All right, you could write your own program to do that. All right, it's pretty much, that's what Word did, or Microsoft did with Word. All right, string concatenation, string replacement, string trimming. Again, these are all things, if you haven't seen them, you're gonna be working with them in several languages. This is kind of important right here. They talk about the value of, all right? And notice you can use value of with just about anything. String value of, well, who cares? It returns the string representation of a double argument that's passed in. It's kind of like using two string. There's always more than one way of doing the same thing. String Builder, I mentioned to you already, and as it says, it's similar to the string class, but you may change its content. So again, as I already told you, it is mutable, all right? Notice when you set it up, oops, you can set it up blank, which means by default, it assumes you'll have 16 or less characters in it. But if you get more than 16, it automatically doubles it to 32. If you get to 32, it'll double it again. Okay? Or you can put in here an actual length. And the only reason I'm even taking a second to mention this is when we use, we've looked a little bit at this, all right, when we went over and talked a little bit about um, array lists and you saw stuff like, you know, equals string, and it would look like, you know, something like that, or maybe the type, I don't even remember now, if it's the string in here. And then it had paren paren. All right, you may or may not remember that, but the, that paren paren that you see right there, that's this one right here. Because it's possible when you create an array list to give it a size. And even if you don't give it a size, you have to put the parens in there because that says that using array list is a method. And there's a lot of different things that you can do with it. You can run many of the string methods with that. <coughs> Two string, we've looked at. You already learned now a little bit. We talked about in the last chapter, the one before, how to override the two-string method. As it says, if you need to convert a string builder to a regular string, so in other words, again, 
I sit there and I say to you, give me your first name. I put that into a string builder. I say, give me your middle name. I add that to the string builder. I say, give me your last name. I add that to the string builder. Now my string is complete. Now I can take that string builder and I can copy it to a regular string and use the two string method on it to work with it. Kind of a neat program here. There, the, what happens is you put in telephone numbers, okay, and you can, you can either put in, I think it's just like number, 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 number type of thing, and it'll format them for you. It's in here someplace. There it is. So you can put it in like this and have it formatted for you, or you can enter it formatted and you can remove all of the formatting. That may not look like it's that important, but if you're throwing stuff into a database, you might want it set up so that it looks like this, but you might want it stored like this. You may or may not remember this, but when you, when you were in Access, one of the first things that you should have been shown in there is when you, in Access, when you were starting to build things and you, you had to put in information and something was a phone number, you had your choice you could store it, you could show it with a mask. That's what it shows by default, which are the parens, the space, and the dash. But then you can save it either like that, or you can save it without any mask, which means it's going to save it like this down here. The advantage of saving it like that is if you've got millions or billions of phone numbers, it's going to save you a little bit because, you know, you're not going to have the parens, and if you've got a blank space there, even though they don't, you put that in. Technically, yeah. But if, if you're using a regular expression pattern, you know, it's not going to matter too much. No. Tokenizing strings here on 593, what we talked about before. All right. You can use a split method to tokenize strings. What does that mean? A split method would take these right here, which is one string, and for lack of better words, would do the equivalent of converting it into a string array with four different elements in it. If you're going to do that, if you're going to do that, you have to have a natural something in between each one that's the same between each one that you can use as the tokenizer token. All right? Just so you know, it's because you'll hear about them next semester. If, if you do this split, the equivalent of that PHP, it's called explode. That takes a string and it breaks it up into a basically a, char a bunch of you know, character or string arrays. But when you want to bring it together again, so if you want to take, if I had this as an array with four different values in it and I wanted to bring it back into this, I'd use implode. And again, notice it can be anything. Space is up here, there it's semicolons, here it's dashes, here it's forward slashes but it has to be a consistent character, all right? And they mention in here, but sometimes when you do this, it's going to be more than one character. So you'll notice if you look in here, because this is starting to show you regular expression handling, this is saying here it could be either an at sign or it could be a dot, all right? So if you were taking something like this, all right, like an email address, all right, one token, you know, Joe, and then a token, Gaddis Books, then a token, com. All right. Again, it depends on what your inputs are and exactly how you're trying to break it up. Maybe important, as it says here, to trim a string before you tokenize it. All right, and when you trim, if you do a straight trim, you're getting rid of any leading blanks and any trailing blanks. That's exactly what they're talking about here. So that would get rid of these leading blanks and those trailing blanks. All right. So wrapper classes for the numeric data types. As I mentioned before, notice there's six of them. So what's missing? Char and Boolean, because it doesn't make any sense to have wrapper classes for those two. All right? So as it says, the API provides wrapper classes for each of the numeric data types. They can be useful to perform useful operations involving primitive 
numeric values. And as already mentioned, you've already worked with some of these. Notice the two string. You can do stuff like this. It says each of the numeric wrapper classes has a two string. So you can do this. Normally, Java is really liberal that even if, you, if, if you're in a string and in a string you combine a string with a numeric value, it'll automatically convert it for you. This is a forced conversion right here. All right. And as mentioned, you can convert things to different number systems. Min value and max value are literally two different constants that show the biggest integer value your system will support and the smallest integer value that it will support. All right? Probably the hardest part of this chapter is the bottom of page, whatever this page is, 597. All right? And going on to the next page when they talk about auto boxing and unboxing. All right? And it's only a couple pages. But if we look here, because it looks weird, integer number equals new integer 7. And I look at that, and, and I, I like, why would you ever want to do that? First of all, notice it's the word integer. It's not int. Since it's the word integer and it's capital, number is now an object. Okay? But it's an object that holds a primitive value in it. So it holds the number 7 in it. So why would you want to do that? Because if you have, if, if you do this, you're able to use some built-in methods on number, whereas if I said int number equals 7, I couldn't do it. And that's what the author talks about in here. So as it says, auto-boxing is what's known as automatically boxing up a value inside of its object. That's what it's doing here. When you do it the other way, it's called unboxing. And there are plenty of articles out there on the net that will show that, that kind of stuff, too. And I, you know, the reason that I mention it is I know of at least one person who graduated from here and went for an interview as a Java programmer and was asked, what's the difference between boxing and unboxing? All right. So it's the kind of question that you could conceivably be asked. Okay, the question again was, what does it gain you? It allows you to, to use what otherwise would be a simple variable. It allows you to make it an object so that you're able to run different methods on it. But, but then when you unbox it, you're basically saying, okay, now create it, you know, use it again as though it's a simple variable. All right. And finally, they end the chapter with showing this problem-solving thing right here. Professor Harrison keeps her students' test scores on an Excel spreadsheet. And they got a program that'll do this. Doesn't look that different from a program that you did. All right. But there's a little bit more to it. All right. So I will tell you, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go upstairs. I, I thought it'd be a short lecture. I didn't think it'd be quite this short. But um, the program that we're going to do as a class on Wednesday is number seven on page 610. All right. Write a program that displays a simulated paycheck. The program should ask the user to enter the date, the payee's name, the amount of the check, and then display a simulated check that looks at least somewhat like this. All right. And there's a few caveats, there's a few things that you have to think about. There are a lot of different ways to write this. I wrote it one way, and then I looked at the author's. I did. I went and looked at the author's uh, key, and I think he did it better than I did. So I, and, and there were a couple things I liked better, so I kind of combined them. All right? But when you think about it, because I've, I've given this out as an assignment before, and when I run tests on it, as an example right here, 
All right, 1920 and 85 cents. We could have put dollars there, but that's fine the way it is. That might look fine. But I've already set it up where, where as an example, instead of saying 20, I'll have 21. And it'll still, somebody's will still print out as 20. Or here, you know, I'll have a certain number of cents and they won't work right. The program that we'll go over on Wednesday, it's very short. Okay? It's not perfect. There are many ways that it could be improved. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go upstairs and grab those copies of the program that I did. In fact, I can even show it to you. You're going to get a copy of this in just a second. So first of all, here's the check writer that I just called check. And when you look at it, hopefully, there you go. It's not a long program. You know, well, that's long enough. There's 200 lines. Yeah, but there are a lot of comments in it. It's really not a very long program. All right. And the other one, the calculator, which I call calculator non-GUI. Again, you're going to get a copy of this. This is the one I'm going to run up and grab you a copy of. All right, so if I run this one, all right, comes up with a menu. You know, what do you want to do? If you put something out of range, it just gives you the menu again. Didn't like that, but so if I put, for example, a four in here, it shows me twenty-three divided by seven. Okay, so a one will show the the sum, a two will show the difference, a three will show the product, and a four will show the quotient. I left modulus out. All right, and uh, five ends the program. Not at all. I mean, I wrote it and I got done, and this was. So if you lo look at it, you go, this really stinks. I wrote it. This is 100% mine. And I didn't spend much time on it. All right. But we'll look at that, and like I said, we'll look at that two weeks from now, and then on that last Wednesday, we'll go back and rewrite this, and we'll write this a different way than what you've seen before. All right. So I'm done. I'm going to go upstairs, though, and I'm going to grab the copies that I have of that calculator, and I'll bring them back down there.